everyone and everything is getting connected to the internet. And we're pretty much already to the point where everything does depend on the internet. Pretty much every aspect of our daily lives, government, uh, business, entertainment, all depend in a critical way on the internet. And uh, you know, in many respects, that's a great thing. Things are a lot easier. They're a lot faster. You have access to a lot more information. Uh, you know, it's much more economical uh, to have things on the internet. Costs less. You can have uh, faster business transactions. You know, the one problem, though, is that with everything depending on the internet, we're now in a situation where nothing is safe. And really, I, I mean nothing is safe. And uh, you know, just look at any newspaper. You know, we already talked about today, pick up any newspaper today and read the latest headlines that you know, now we believe, or our government believes, that you know, 80 million personal ideas, uh, IDs and all their medical information, credit card information, social security number, the whole nine yards, actually that, that hack was done by a foreign government, uh, you know, namely China. Uh, so it really is a problem when, when there's so many vulnerabilities. You know, right now, as I speak, there's at least 175,000 websites that are under attack. Uh, people could be trying to bring down the site. People can be trying to steal confidential information to the site, stealing your credit cards, your personal identity. Uh, the cost of you know, these attacks is enormous. I, I think 400 billion underestimates the real cost. And whatever the number, it is rapidly rising uh, on a global level. And you know, this begs the question of, of why. Why is this happening? Who's doing it? You know, back in the old days, in the early days of the internet, you know, the only attacks were, you know, call them the glory hounds or the prototype of a teenager in the garage trying to make a name for uh, himself or herself by hacking a website and claiming credit. That is not the problem today. Uh, you have the growth of political hacktivism. Uh, these are loosely affiliated groups, uh, groups like Anonymous, uh, that have themes that are popular themes in many cases. You know, the, the sit-in on Wall Street, uh, you know, maybe a government does something that a lot of people in the world don't like, maybe you wouldn't like, and they will organize people to get together. Uh, they'll contribute their, their com computational resources, their connectivity, to engage in an attack on a website that's identified with whatever entity that did something uh, that a group of people don't like. And it's um, loosely affiliated, it's distributed, hard to really do anything about, and it's a, a big threat. Uh, increasingly, you have state-sponsored attacks. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of headlines about pretty much all the North American banks getting brought down at will by groups out of the Middle East that were not you know, friendly to the United States. Um, you know, more recently, you know, very uh, widely known attack uh, you know, against Sony Entertainment. Uh, and the story being that they were going to uh, release a film that was uh, offensive to North Korea. And uh, you know, a group that is allegedly affiliated with North Korea uh, penetrated Sony, destroyed all their records, uh, and released all their email and also some personal information to the public. Uh, really a devastating you know, attack on Sony Entertainment. Uh, so, and you now have, of course, a few days later, uh, our government said we thought that the North Korean government had something to do with this, and uh, lo and behold, the North Korean internet, such as it is, went down uh, for about a day after that. Uh, so you have activities where now big nation states are engaging uh, in cyber crime. Uh, and of course, cyber crime itself is a very profitable business. Today, the black market rate, if somebody steals your credit card, is about a dollar per card number. Uh, if they can steal your identity, uh, social security number, date of birth, all that kind of stuff you use to identify yourself, that's worth about $12. Uh, and there's some pretty you know, famous examples here. Uh, you know, with the IRS, for example, uh, recently it was disclosed that uh, well, people's past uh, history of filings with the IRS were stolen, their identities were stolen, and then uh, criminals were using that to actually file returns on behalf of those people and just changing the address of where the check should be sent. Uh, I am one of those people. Uh, now, they say there's only 15,000. Oh, we got another one here in the audience, yeah. Uh, 
Now, just on this sample, either they were highly targeted by some profile, which is possible, or there's more than 15,000 that it happened to. Uh, you know, and it, I got to tell you, it's a huge pain. Uh, of course, I'm not wild about filing online anyway, but, but I did through my accountants. We can never do that again. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a mess because as part of it, I'm now getting audited. Uh, even though I had nothing to do with somebody coming in, hacking the IRS system, stealing my identity, and then filing my returns for me with a different place to, to send the check. You know, a much bigger hack, you know, happened earlier, of course, over the past of the last year uh, against a very big insurance company called Anthem. 80 million uh, personal identities and medical histories were stolen. Uh, the person who's with us, Casey Kita, who helped me make these slides, she's one of the 80 million. I'm sure more, a bunch of you in this group are part of that 80 million. And uh, well, there's several people raising their hands. You didn't, yeah, a lot of people here, part of that. And in today's paper, they're now saying that this attack was done by China. Uh, now you might say, well, why does China want your medical records? Well, you know, they probably want all the information they can about, you know, uh, people in the United States, especially if you have positions of influence or power. Maybe that information they can get about you could be useful, you know, in, in some political way in the future. Uh, but this is a huge problem. And I think as a rule of thumb, you can assume pretty much everything that's online has been, uh, you know, taken or stolen by some entity out there, and probably not for a good purpose. You know, it's very, very easy to do. Uh, you know, one popular way probably a lot of you have heard about is called phishing. This is an example of a typical phishing email. You know, it's highly personalized. You know, dear Tom, they know my name. They know I'm at Akamai. They know that at Akamai, you know, we have to go through security training. So we won't do something stupid like, you know, click on a link in an email. Uh, yeah. You know, and so here it says, I got to go visit training. That looks, you know, my eyes aren't too good anymore. That looks like Akamai. Actually, it's not. It's A-K-A-R-N-A-I. But unless I've got my glasses on, which I don't wear enough, that looks like Akamai. I know I'm supposed to do it sometime soon, and it comes from my chief security officer. Now, actually, emails like this, he sends me just to try to trick me into clicking on a bad link, <laughs> so I, I look bad, you know. But um, we get these all the time, and they're really good. And you know you can't blame people really for clicking on them. And as soon as you do, you're done. You know you've imported malware that's exploited something on your machine. Your your personal records are going out the door. Everything about you is gone at this point. As soon as you you click on that, really hard. Uh, you know everything is getting connected. Uh, not just your your cell phones, but your refrigerators are getting connected. Your cars, if you have a new car, they're connected. There's going to be tens of billions of devices being connected. And in many ways, this is great, because all those things you can now control remotely. They can have sensors. You get real-time information, really, really good stuff, except that now they all can become agents of attack. And, and whether or not they're infected, just the way the basic internet protocols work, and the, the leading source of attack now to bring down websites is what's called a reflection attack. And more or less what this means is the bad, the bad entity out there sends a request to all these devices saying, I want to establish a connection with you. And these devices respond to the protocol and say, OK, I'm ready to talk. They send packets back on the internet saying, I'm ready to talk. The only problem is the, the attacker doesn't put their return address on the request. They put the return address of the target, say, a, a bank they don't like for whatever reason. And so now you have all these devices that aren't even infected swarming the target with responses saying, I'm ready to talk. And it just crushes the site's infrastructure. They can't handle all the load. Uh, and that's the leading source of attack now for, for the called DOS attacks, or denial of service attacks you hear about. Now, to, you know, as if it wasn't bad enough uh, that there's you know, so many easy ways to get in and infect uh, you or your, your machines or websites, the fundamental protocols that are used in the internet to do everything including security to do encryption, are all vulnerable. And I think you know, there's dozens of examples, but I think the best uh, you know, came out about a year ago. Uh, there's a protocol called OpenSSL. SSL is what is used to encrypt communications on the internet. When you buy something, you send your credit card over, and you get, or you get your bank statement back, you don't want the bad guys getting your credit card, so that's all encrypted. It's encrypted using SSL. 
open SSL is a version that everybody uses because it's open to the world. It's free to use. And, and open protocols are generally considered to be the best because, well, it wasn't created by a government who might be trying to, to spy. It was created by security researchers. In theory, everybody's vetted it because it's published how the code works. And, um, and that's, that's the best way to go, accepted practice. Now, uh, you know, about four years ago, a patch was put into OpenSSL by the, the open source community um, that was used as a liveness check. So if you want to check, is the server working and is it doing SSL appropriately, that's what this patch allowed you to do. Now, I normally don't tell people the details, but we've got a technical audience here, so I, I will. The way the patch worked is it's sort of like a ping, you know, like a, a submarine ping. You send the signal out, does it come back? And if it does, oh, it looks like it's alive. There's something out there responding. Now, in this case, the idea was, as the ping, you'd send out 64 kilobytes of data. Could be anything. And then the server, using SSL, would send back the same 64 kilobytes of data. And so you'd know, oh, it heard me, it listened, and it sent it back. I'm, I'm good to go. Now, the way the protocol got implemented was, at that server side, it only allocated memory for 16 kilobytes. OK? But it's supposed to send back 64. So it takes the 64 I give it. It remembers 16 in memory. And it's got to send back 64. So it, it says, OK, I'll take the next 48 kilobytes in memory and send it back. Well, guess what happens to be in those next 48 kilobytes of memory is the secret key that you use for all of your communication for a year or longer. So just by doing this liveness check, the bad guy gets back, more often than not, your secret key. So everything that you're doing, or your bank is doing, or your government is doing, for the next year plus, till they change the key, the bad guy now has. So nothing is secure. All right, so you say, well, wow, who would figure that out? It's amazing. In three and a half years that this bug was out there, there was no public disclosure. And uh, so we asked our security guys, you know, we told them there's a bug in SSL. Find it. it. Took them 30 minutes to find it. Now, you can speculate, you know, did our government know? Did the Chinese know? Did organized crime know? And what did they do during those three and a half years? I won't get into that. But just the core protocols are all vulnerable. Now, in the face of this challenge, you know, we need institutions like MIT, we need companies, and we need the government to respond. This is a very hard technical problem, hard business problem, hard political problem, you know, to catch up here. Um, it's one of the reasons that we created Akamai out of MIT back in 1998, based on research done here at MIT. Uh, and our goal then, and it is today, is to help make the internet be fast, reliable, and secure. And I'll just give you a high level view of how it works. You use Akamai every day without knowing it, but when you surf on the web, probably you're using us. So let me explain what happens under the covers. Here's the world first without us. If you want something from a website, you send a message to get it to the data center or the cloud that, that you know, is hosting that website. And it goes a long way through the internet, and eventually, hopefully, you get what you want. The problem is the bad guys know where that data center is, and so they send stuff that infects it, and they get back your credit card, they get back your money, uh, things that they want you know, to, to do that are bad. And also when they do that, they also can you know, traffic, they can make traf ra ra traffic routed from you to them. Then they infect you. Phishing is one way they can do that. There's many other ways. And so then they infect you, and then they own everything about you. Um, and the way we try to stop these kinds of attacks is we place our software, our computer equipment, in thousands of places around the world. You know, we're in, in hundreds of cities, we're in over a thousand networks, and the idea is that we're intercepting that traffic on behalf of our, our customers who are the big websites of the world. First of all, we make it faster because maybe we've got what you want. You know, it might be a, a software download. You're getting your iOS upgrade for your, your iPhone, for example or you got some app you're loading onto your phone. So it's local, so it makes it be a lot faster. And we built our own virtual internet on top of the real internet. So when you go to get your bank balance, you go to buy something, we make sure that happens a lot faster and a lot more secure than it would be happening otherwise. 
And also, when the bad guys come, we intercept their traffic right nearby, and we block it. So it never gets close to the data center that's holding your, your bank balance or your credit card. Uh, and so they don't get in here uh, to infect it. Uh, so that's a high-level view of what we do. Uh, it was a, originally a, a theoretical research project back in the mid-'90s here at MIT with, boy, you know, how would we design a better internet using mathematics and algorithms? And um, through the, the Sloan School 50K contest, one thing led to another, and we, we created Akamai. Um, today, Akamai carries between 15 and 30% of all internet traffic. We're the biggest entity out there that none of you have ever heard of because we're behind the scenes. You don't know it, but whenever you go to any of the top commerce sites or top media and entertainment companies, oh, or if you're involved in the US military or pretty much any government site, uh, any leading bank, what's happening is your traffic is actually coming through us. And we make it be faster and more reliable and more secure. And uh, that results in a lot of transactions. So in a typical day, we'll do over 2 trillion transactions on this platform. Uh, and a transaction is as simple as you go to look at a news site, and your browser requests a picture or the story or something from that news site, maybe an ad even, uh, and then we send it back to your device. And you think you went to the news site. Actually, uh, you went to Akamai. Uh, now, if you'd like to learn more, you can go to a, a site, stateoftheinternet.com. And uh, you can download the most recent attack report to see what's going on out there. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>